Good morning. You're listening to Retake Our Democracy, a 30-minute weekly show that airs at 8.30 a.m. each Saturday morning on KSFR 101.1 FM, your Santa Fe public radio station. I'm Paul Gibson, the host of Retake Our Democracy. Today, I'm going to be speaking with Alicia Shaw, campaign coordinator for Public Power New Mexico. It's a coalition collaborating to educate constituents and legislatures of the economic and environmental benefits of local public ownership and management of energy in New Mexico. I'll get back to Alicia in just a moment, but we first a few quick announcements. I hope everyone had a lovely Thanksgiving with friends and family and is still enjoying leftovers. We sure are. Um, I also wanted to mention that last week I spoke with Pam Roy, Director of Food to Table and New Mexico Food and Agricultural Policy Council. Um, it was a very interesting interview and I, I I would hope that if you missed it, you could go to, uh, I'll just remind you that you can get a recording of this show and any show, including the one with Pam, by going to retakeourdemocracy.org, clicking on retake on the radio on the right side of the homepage, and then all of the recordings will be listed in chronological order right there. So you can binge watch retake radio for free. You can cancel your Apple subscription, Apple TV subscription. Before we get started, I also want to acknowledge that we're conducting the show on stolen Tewa land, and I want to thank our Tewa neighbors for being such good stewards of the land. We could learn much from their custodial caring for the land, water, and air. Last announcement. On Wednesday, December 7th, from 6 to 7.30, we will conduct our fifth Zoominar, this one focusing on the work of a coalition of which Retake is a member, Public Power New Mexico. You're going to hear a lot about that in just a minute. Um, Retake, even before joining that coalition, has writ had written quite a bit about um, public power and local choice energy, the legislation that we're going to be seeking to pass in this session. Um, so if you go to retakeourdemocracy.org and click on, uh, just get to the homepage and go to the search engine on the right, just put in public power or local choice energy and you'll find some good in information there. You can also go to public power NM. Uh, that's the website for the coalition, and they have information there as well. Um, you're going to hear an awful lot about public power and local choice energy today, and I hope it incentivizes you to sign up for our Zoominar on December 7th. Um, there's a link on our uh, actions and events page to that Zoominar. So if you just go there and click on the link, you can register for the Zoominar because you have to register to participate. Okay. Let's meet Alicia Shaw. Welcome to the show, Alicia. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's our pleasure. I like to let guests introduce themselves. So how did you become involved in advocating for public power and other energy issues? Well, I've been involved in grassroots organizing efforts of all sorts of kinds throughout my whole life. I've worked on issues including pollution issues, consumer protection, wildlife, affordable housing, education, racial justice, workers' rights, economic justice, and environmental justice, as well as on political campaigns, and even for state government at the New Mexico State Land Office. And I grew up watching shows like Captain Planet and David the Gnome, and from a very young age, I knew that global warming was perhaps the biggest existential threat to all living things on this planet. And my organizing work has, has sought to address this in many different ways, but none so directly and pragmatically as organizing for public power. And I'm thrilled to be working to create energy democracy in New Mexico, to create a reality where our communities can choose to generate or buy their own renew renewable electricity, because I think together we can make some very simple legislative changes, which will really tangibly help us avert climate change disaster and bring so many other great benefits to our communities. Okay, so let's start with the broader topic of public power. Um, and then, and that will help us contextualize both community solar and local choice energy. So can you tell us just a little bit about what is public power and why is public ownership of energy a good idea? Absolutely. Uh, so public power is a broad term that describes a national movement uh, to allow communities to have more democratic control over the way their electricity is generated, distributed, and priced, and, and managed. 
Throughout the U.S., there's electrical utilities that are owned and operated by communities, by municipalities, by tribes, by counties, by states. And frequently, these utilities have lower rates and greater reliability. In New Mexico, we have seven municipally owned electric utilities, and the average monthly bills of these local community-owned providers are actually 25% less than what the investor-owned utilities in our state charge, according to reports that you can find from the U.S. Energy Information Administration. And the communities that are served by utilities that are owned by communities, they have more control over how um, they're managed, and they enjoy the benefits of increased investment in their local communities, including good jobs and more revenue for local government. Communities that have a say in how their electricity is generated are also paving the way to our transition to renewable energy. All the communities in the US that are powered by 100% renewable energy are all served by community owned utilities. Dozens of communities have achieved this and hundreds have committed to getting there. In our current system, we, New Mexicans, we don't have a choice about who our electricity provider is or what kind of electricity um, you know, we're getting and we deserve one. And I just read a great story in a, about a community uh, in Florida called Babcock Ranch. And it's a planned community of about 2000 homes, just 12 miles from Fort Myers, which just got hit really hard by Hurricane Ian. And this community is 100% renewable. It's powered by a 75 megawatt solar array. And when Hurricane Ian hit, they never lost power. And not only were they able to keep their lights on, but they were also able to su provide support to the communities that surrounded them that lost everything in the hurricane. So I think this is a great example of, of what we can achieve with community owned renewable power. You know, we not only can reduce our carbon emissions and invest in our communities and lower our electricity costs for working families, but we also can create greater resiliency, which I think we're gonna need as more extreme weather events are escalating around the world. Yeah, I think you're probably right on that one. So the coalition initially developed a reasonably detailed plan for how the state could take ownership of all of its energy and both, um, uh, you know, build the infrastructure itself and then supply all of the energy the state would need and it would be 100% renewable, plus export boatloads of energy to states to the west of us that are also in need of uh, more renewable energy and can't generate it themselves. This would have made a, an enormous profit for the state on an ongoing basis. Um, but at one point we pulled back and decided that it might be a bridge too far to get the, um, the legislature and the governor to sign off on something that sounds a little scary. You know, we're gonna take over all the energy use and what happens if there's a brownout and you know, can the government manage these kinds of things and all of those kinds of concerns we would hear. So we kind of punted on that for now with the idea of advancing local choice energy. So in some way is local choice energy kind of a, a way of letting the state test the waters a little bit before it takes a deep plunge? You know, I think local choice energy is an exciting opportunity for our communities to be empowered to have a choice in generating and purchasing the electricity that they want. I don't think it's necessarily more modest than statewide public power. I think it's a simple legislative change that would bring energy democracy to New Mexico, which is a big deal. And I think that it could lead to the state and the region being powered by the sun through community owned providers that invest their profits locally. I think local choice energy is inspiring and it's a tangible way that we can counterbalance these challenges that we have because of climate change and also provide so many other benefits to New Mexicans. Certainly, it is foreseeable that the successes of local choice energy could inspire further action down the road at the state to leverage the significant opportunities you're talking about for export and, you know, expanding the state re revenues through, through a statewide utility that you described. But I think local choice energy is, is a significant step in and of itself to achieving a renewable energy future right here and right now, one that our communities drive. Okay, I just, I don't disagree. Um, so what is local choice energy exactly? You know, like how does it work? And then the follow-up question is, has there been local choice energy introduced in the legislature before and what was its fate? Yeah, so local choice energy is legislation 
that would empower communities to have a choice in purchasing or generating electricity, which we don't have right now. Interested local governments could build their own solar arrays or purchase renewable power from other providers like local tribal utilities, for example, and they would partner with the investor owned utilities like PNM to transmit that electricity over the existing grid for a fee. Residents of communities that have local choice energy providers would have a choice to keep their existing utility service or switch to a local choice energy provider. And local choice energy has been previously introduced. It was introduced in 2019 and in 2021. And unfortunately it died both times as so many good pieces of legislation do frequently in our very short legislative sessions. But we do know that there's widespread support for this. You know, many polls show that across the political spectrum, more than three quarters of voters want their electric utilities to invest more in solar energy. And with local choice energy, we can grant our communities the right to direct their futures to make these choices that support the resiliency of their electricity and local economic development, and we can accelerate our transition to renewables. So for example, if Bernalillo County, Bernalillo County decided that they wanted to launch local choice energy for that county, um, and legislation had passed. So what they would do is basically put uh, their utility IOU on alert that they were going to be developing their own utility um, for people living in Bernalillo County. And Bernalillo County would also let all their constituents know that this was going to be an option for them. And then Bernalillo County would be able to either purchase energy, and that could happen very quickly on the internet. I mean, not on the internet, but on the grid. Or they could, and, and at the same time, they could say, all right, we're going to invest X amount of dollars in starting to build our own generation. But in the meantime, we're going to purchase it from A, B, or C, who's providing 100% renewables. And that, and that could happen within months after uh, legislation passes. Is that the way it would work? Yeah, so um, municipalities or, or, you know, uh, counties, as you described, they would, if local choice energy were the law of the land, they would have to uh, pass an ordinance to create a local choice energy provider. Um, you know, if tribal governments wanted to go this way, they'd have to do whatever tribal process was in place to establish that. Um, and then they could, you know, create the infrastructure to generate or buy uh, the electricity that they want that would be transmitted over the investor owned utility grid for a fee. So it doesn't really change, you know, it's not like there's no eminent domain. It's not really changing the existing system. It's just giving our communities more choices. And it's a very simple change um, that's very exciting. So we're going to have to take a quick break here because I've got to tell, uh, remind our listeners that you're listening to KSFR 101.1 FM, your Santa Fe public radio station. And it's in times like these with all the misinformation that you get in social media and on the mainstream media that a, a, a station that is wedded to the truth and provides solid local and state news on a regular basis and provides programs like Democracy Now, where you can get the national news that's, and Amy Goodman is just the best at giving you what's really going on, not what politicians would like you to think is going on. And uh, all of this comes to you at, at no cost at home. It's like free, right? You just turn on your radio and there it is. But it doesn't, it, it isn't free. It costs money to produce these, this programming. And it's also, and KSFR also offers great music and cultural um, programming. So what I would ask you to do is when you get done listening to this program, go to ksfr.org and click on the donate button and pass along 10, 20, or 50 bucks and look at it as your ticket for admission to some great programming. And on behalf of KSFR, I'd like to thank you for your donation now. Now let's get back to Alicia. Okay, so are there many examples in other states where they've implemented local choice energy? I mean, we're gonna be asking our legislators to you know, take a leap of faith. Um, do we have some information that might make it easier for them to do so? Absolutely, there are so many inspiring stories. So um, there's something called community choice aggregation, which is also known as CCA for short. And that's another name for what we're calling local choice energy in New Mexico. And this law has been 
similar laws that would enable that enable communities to do this have been passed in 10 states, California, Illinois, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Rhode Island, and Virginia. And millions of Americans in those states and more than 1300 communities are served by CCAs. And what the stats show is that they're enjoying lower rates, they're enjoying more reliable power, more local jobs, greater investment in their community budgets and local economies, and a greatly accelerated transition to renewable energy. Some of these communities have already achieved 100% renewable power, and many are far ahead of what is standard in communities that are exclusively served by investor-owned utilities. So, you know, the investor-owned utilities, they make, you know, a, a guaranteed 10 to 12% profit, depending on which IOU you're talking about. Um, and they pay enormous salaries for their, uh, you know, their CEOs and CFOs and so forth. We don't do that with uh, local choice energy. So there's going to be some extra profit for the community. What happens with that profit? It, it's invested in, in local government budgets. It's invested in local economies. And the community actually has more uh, recourse to direct the you know, the direction of their local community owned utility, you know, they really have, there's more accountability. Um, there's not that profit incentive. It's really all about community benefit, which is why the rates are cheaper and why um, renewables are, are more popular with these community owned utilities. Okay. So can you tell us exactly how passing this, what, what is it in the bill itself that would then enable uh, let's say a county or a tribe to be able to develop their own utility? Um, well, it would basically empower communities to do that. And it, it basically creates the um, legal mechanism for how they would be created and um, administered. And one thing that I feel like I should mention is like there's a huge opportunity coming right now uh, down the pike for um, you know, there's there's an unprecedented amount of federal money that's going to become invested in our communities through the Inflation Reduction Act. $385 billion of that is being allocated toward clean energy production and addressing climate risk. And then there's also an executive order that President Biden signs within days of taking office uh, called the Just, it creates a Justice 40 initiative that ensures that 40% of federal investments benefit disadvantaged communities that are marginalized, underserved, and overburdened by pollution. And those categories of investment are climate change, clean energy and energy efficiency, clean transit, affordable and sustainable housing, training and workforce development, uh, remediation and reduction of legacy pollution, and then the development of critical clean water and wastewater infrastructure. So if we pass local choice energy in 2023, we will be empowering our communities to be able to create their own local choice energy providers and then apply for this funding and really leverage, fully leverage this funding to build out the clean energy infrastructure um, that can power our state into the future. So I think that there's a real time sensitive once in a lifetime opportunity here um, that can really change our world and how we, and how we, um, and how we live and produce energy here in New Mexico. So instead of, uh, say, for example, Gallup investing all their energy and uh, and grant funds and so forth in producing hydrogen, which is a total fantasy um, in terms of it's actually working in long term, Gallup could invest, um, could seek federal grant funding to uh, create their own wind and solar arrays and then um, go through, this is assuming that local choice energy passed, then they would uh, be able to create their own utility powered by their own solar and wind and distribute it to their community, correct? Absolutely, yeah. So, so if there's all this great stuff it, that uh, has been done in other states, where is the opposition to this? That's a great question. Um, I would say that most of that opposition to local choice energy comes from investor-owned utilities and people and institutions that are entrenched with them. 
For example, there are many elected officials in New Mexico who receive very significant political contributions from these investor-owned utilities and their PACs and people associated with them. And so 73% of New Mexicans are currently served by three electric utilities that are owned by investors. That's PM, that's SPS, which is owned by Excel, and that's EPE. And as you mentioned earlier, these, these investor-owned utilities are required to generate profit for their shareholders and their executives. And that comes at the expense of our community. You know, they have monopoly control over how our electricity is generated, how it's distributed, how it's sold. And it sure seems like they want to keep that monopoly and resist any attempts to empower our communities to have other choices in generating or buying renewable energy. And so I feel like they're, you know, they're obstructing our transition to renewables because they make more money on these dangerous and destructive fossil fuels. And for example, in 2021, PM had only 10% solar in its energy portfolio. SPS only had 2%. And then EPA only had 5% uh, percent in total renewables in its portfolio in 2020. And so, but, but even though they have a lot of power, I do still think that they're in the minority. Because when I talk to people about this, most folks I know just love the idea of community owned renewable power. They get that it's more resilient. They get that it's more accountable. They get that it's more sustainable. They get that it's local economic development and it's cheaper. And I think our communities want these choices. So we're building this grassroots movement and I believe that we can give our communities this choice and we really have to. If a simple legal change like this can make such positive impacts in the world, I think it's practically criminal to deny it. You know, we have more than 300 days of sunshine in New Mexico, and the total electricity generation, uh, according to the latest stats I saw in the state, are six and a half percent of it solar. So, with local choice energy, we can immediately empower our communities to change this story. And I think we have to if we want the future generations to thrive. So, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Alicia, but. Um... Let me ask you this, has the local choice energy bill been drafted yet and which legislators will be sponsoring the legislation? The local choice energy bill is drafted. Senators Carrie Hamblin and Liz Stefanik are leading this effort and others in both chambers uh, of the legislature are in the process of signing on. Um, I will say that this bill is probably the simplest, the shortest and cleanest version of local choice energy that we've ever pursued. Uh, and one important new change in the new bill is uh, the addition of language to protect workers and support unions. Okay, yes, that's where some of the opposition came last time for sure. Um, let's see. So if um, what causes the public power New Mexico coalition to think that in 2023, we might actually be able to get this passed given that it's been defeated twice? And the legislature, at least, thankfully, hasn't gotten any worse. We did pretty well in our election. Thankfully. Well, you know, we have support from communities and local governments across the state. And I think we, we know that the time is now to act. Local choice energy is simple legislation. It'll make a positive difference in our state, in our communities, in our local economies, and for our environment. And I believe we have enough leaders now who see the unprecedented opportunities that we have to leverage the federal funding I was talking about and to catalyze a democratic renewable energy future today. I think most of us can agree that resiliency is good, local jobs are good, local bills, lower bills, lower bills are good, local economic development is good, clean energy is good, more money invested in our communities is good. And I believe that we can do this. We can we can have these great things if we try, and I think that we really can do this. Okay, well, thank you very much for all of this. Last question. Can you tell us where people can learn more about public power and the Public Power New Mexico Coalition? Absolutely. So you can visit publicpowernm.org, and you can reach out to us if you want to get involved. And you mentioned we're doing a webinar, a Zoominar, Retake Zoominar on December 7th at 6 p.m. And that'll be another opportunity to learn more about this and ask questions and discuss it. So um, yeah, please spread the word, please learn more, please reach out. And yeah, thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for being here. And um, I'll see you uh, later this afternoon. Is it later this afternoon or no, tomorrow afternoon for uh, public power? 
coalition meeting. And thank you very much for being here. So um, thank you, Paul. To our listeners, we recorded this show on November 9th. So as of this moment, uh, I'm sorry. Yes, November 9th. And the election has uh, is over. And so it'd be awkward not to comment on it at all. Uh, I only have about two minutes. And so I just want to say that things went way better than we thought they were. And by now, you have read a lot about that. But if you want to go to retakeourdemocracy.org, we have created a district by district analysis of how the races went, all 70 house races and of all of the uh, statewide races. And it's all in one document on our website, easy to find. Um, just click on election results in the search engine and you'll grab it. And it'll be featured in our next blog that's going out um, on, oh God, I'm getting confused in days, Thursday or Friday of this, of, uh, so it'll have come out by the time you listen to this program. And so if you go to retakeourdemocracy.org, that blog will be near the very top of the homepage and you'll be able to find out. We're gonna have basic commentary on the election results and what we can learn from them, as well as a link then to that deeper analysis that I mentioned. And we'll be back next week. I'm not quite sure who we will have on because we're getting way ahead of ourselves in terms of recordings. We will now have four recordings in the can. And it's sometimes hard to keep track of when different shows that were recorded two weeks ago are going to actually air. Um, but until we meet again, um, I would also ask you, do come, join us at 8 a.m. Um, and listen to Richard Wolf economic update. If you want an excellent analysis of the American economy and why it doesn't work for us, he does that every single week and no one does it better. And it segues nicely into our, our record recordings. So that's it for today. So until we meet again, uh, stay safe, stay healthy, keep eating those um, leftovers and uh, stay active. It's the only way we fix this mess. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye-bye.